So first things first, I know that this is recorded, so this talk will be in English um, for no particular reason at all. Um, and uh, yeah, however, I will speak a bit of Russian in a 30 seconds, so hang in there, people on YouTube. Um, good morning. Dobre utro. Как дела? Все хорошо? Да? Конечно. Конечно. Я утром добрым не бывает, да? Давайте. Давайте попробуем программировать. I guess, programmirovat, ja ne znaju. Davajte. So, I like to dive in um, by saying, you know, good morning. And um, what I want you to take away, why is this not full screening? Aha, there we go. What I want you to take away from this is that it is not that hard to get started, okay? So uh, let's have a look. So here we have a wonderful website, which is probably like the best website ever because it loads in under a second. Um, it's really easy to make this offline available, I guess, and uh, yeah, it's very progressive and it probably works on a potato with Internet Explorer 5. But besides that, we can do things that not necessarily are known to be a web thing. So let's have a look. So here we have this A scene. Now what is that? You probably have not seen this HTML tag before. Just a hint, the, um, the dash in the name of the tag suggests that this is a web component. And this web component comes from this wonderful library called A-Frame. And A-Frame is a Mozilla project. I know that we are at the Google Dev Fest, but hey, I'm a Google web developer expert, so here we go. We are like a big, huge community in the web, so Mozilla does an awesome job, so it gets its props here. So what I can do here is I can basically create my own virtual world. I can say I want a box that is red, and I want to position this somewhere. So now, imagine the scene to be this stage, right? There's an empty space, except for me. Sorry for that. Um, and I can place things here, but also I have a camera here that is basically the user. So the user can turn around and move around, but we start at a position called 000. It's like the origin point. So if I put the box exactly where we stand, we don't see anything because we are inside of the box. That's not quite useful, is it? So how about we move this around a little bit? And um, basically what we do is we use meters, because we are reasonable people and not like using this weird imperial system. And uh, we have these three axes, right? Because we are in three-dimensional space. So we have the x-axis, which goes to the left and to the right, or from your side to the left and to the right. And um, we have the y-axis that goes up and down, and we have a z-axis. And the z-axis tells you how far out of the screen something pops. Originally, when we start, I know, never turn your back to the audience, but deal with it now. You're basically looking into the screen from 0, 0, 0. So we have to move this a little bit. I don't want to move it to the left or to the right. I don't want to move it up or down. But I'm going to move it two meters into the screen. Now, the z-axis tells you how much it moves out of the screen, so we use minus two meters. And if you go back to the browser, you see this. Now, actually, let me change my window uh, arrangement here a little bit. So that's not quite what I expected, because I, th I said we started 0, 0, 0. Yeah. But what counts is here, the 0, 0, 0 is where our feet are. We are a little larger than 0 centimeters, so we are actually at a certain height. Now, the browser has to guess how, l how tall we are, unless we have data on that. So it assumes 1 meter 60. So if I move this up by 1 meter 60, then we are looking straight in the face of a box. Now, that's the least impressive demo that you can probably do. But you see, it already gives us the possibility to walk around it and uh, explore it from all sides, which is very exciting because it's a box. It looks the same from all sides. But let's change something else. So how about we put a sky around this? Now, we can give that a color as well. And because I'm very creative, I'm using sky blue. Hey. Uh, hey, now we have a blue sky. That's still not very interesting. But what gets interesting is when you add a 360-degree camera to the mix. Because if you have a 360-degree camera, the chances are that it produces what is called an equirectangular image. What the hell is that? Well, a 360-degree camera takes a spherical image around itself, right? It's in the middle, and then it takes like an, a sphere around it as a picture. But pictures happen to be usually represented as a rectangle. So we have to kind of like unwrap it as if you have 
imagine you have a balloon and you put a piece of paper around it and then you unwrap it. The piece of paper is still a rectangle, but you can wrap it around the balloon. So that's what happens here. And if you have that, and conveniently I have, then you can say, I want to load this. And here we go. Right? That's, that's not too bad. Now we have a box uh, on top of a mountain. Hey, exciting, or something, I don't know. But, you know, maybe, maybe that isn't like the most exciting thing to do. So let's, let's remove this box, and um, do I have something else here? I think I have like Sky 2 or something. Let's see if that image exists for a second. Of course it does not exist, because, you know, I could have practiced this better. Um, we do have some, oh, it's just called Sky, because, you know, Screw me. I was like, ah, I'm going to be clever because it's not just sky. So here we have some random sky texture thing. And um, what we can do is, so I mean, let me, let me get the box back real quick. Let me say red again. Let me say position 0, 0, minus 2. Actually, minus 5 because, you know, then I don't have to move it up again. All right, here we go. So there's our box. There's a thing here that is quite interesting, which is um, a frame the library comes with built-in developer tools. So if I press the right keys, which are Control-Alt-I, I get this. And that's actually pretty nice, because this is a full-blown 3D editor for all I care. So I can move this around, right? So I can like, go, I want to have it here. And if I just go back to scene, I have it right there. I can copy it over to my HTML if I wish. And I can also explore what else I can do. So I can do a, a circle, a scene, a silent cylinder. I can do a torus knot, which is the most useless shape I've ever seen, but it looks kind of nice, doesn't it? Um, I can change the material. So for instance, I can pick a different color. Maybe this color is what, fans, what I fancy right now. So yeah, you have a very, very flexible way of developing these things. And I can then just press this little button here and export whatever I have created to HTML. That's quite nice. Besides, I can add new things, and uh, adding new things isn't very hard, as I want to show you real quick. So here I have my cylinder. I can scale this as well, so maybe I want to have it taller. Maybe I want to have it rotated a little bit like this. I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing here, but it's definitely art. <laughs> so, OK, cool. But there's like only so many primitives and only so many colors that you can pick. And at some point, it gets boring, doesn't it? So what I want to show you now is something different. Imagine you have someone with 3D modeling skills. Like, luckily, I do have a few colleagues who actually know what they're doing when they open like 3D editing tools. And um, the nice thing is that you can add these things. So, basically, everything you saw so far, the sky, the box, the camera, the lights, everything, is an entity, and these entities can have components. So the geometry, the box geometry, is a component I add to that entity. So what I can do here is I can add a component called GLTF model. This is one of the, the biggest missed opportunities uh, of software development in the last couple of years, I believe. So GLTF is a file format for 3D models. You can imagine it to be like the JPEG, but for 3D models on the web. So um, there's a bunch of different formats. They are more or less efficient. They are more or less easy to parse and work with. This one is optimized for web uh, 3D content. So this is nice. But I'm like, so it is called the GLTF because it's like GL, which is like the graphics library, OpenGL, transfer format. I'm like, but it's optimized for the web. So we should call it WebGL transfer format because then we can have like model.wtf. But hey. They didn't go for WTF. I'm OK with that. Actually, I'm not OK with that. Um, I happen to have a model here with me. Let's see if I guessed the file name right. No, I did not. <laughs> I'm really good at guessing, I guess. So uh, maybe it's like exported. I, one more guess, just, you know. OK, fine. It's not the right thing. Is it? um, let me see. So we have it here. It's export GLTF. Actually, I was right. So why does it not load? Why is it? Um, should not be a problem because it's quite a large model. But let's have a look. No, see, it's not even loading. It's not even trying. Oh, the bastard. 
Uh, let me see. That, I swear to God, that worked five minutes ago. So, um, this is an interesting. Oh, because, okay, right, all right, all right, all right. For some reason, it does not take source, it takes this as a string, apparently. That's news to me, but okay. You know, you never learn. Ah, here we go. Go away. So what, like, this looks a little weird, maybe, because we're at a weird position, but if I walk, you see that we have a pretty nice estate. Uh, this is called the Stahlhaus. It's a concept house from some famous architect that I'm really bad with names, I can never remember. Uh, a co-worker of mine modeled this. Her name is Madalena Kalunda. I'm happy to share her Twitter handle later on. The Twitter profile picture, that, like, the, the header image that she uses, prevents me from showing her Twitter pic uh, page right now because it's kind of against the code of conduct. Find out why yourself. Um, so basically what you see is it is integrating very nicely into the, um, into the inspector because I can just do the same things that I did beforehand. I can move this around, I can position it here, and then I am right at the poolside and I can change things around, I can scale this up. So what I can do, for instance, is I can clone this one and I can use the scale here and say like 0 0.1, 0 0.1, oops, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and then I have a tiny copy of it and I can put that in the pool. 3 deception. Um, Maybe I rotate it a little bit so that it looks nicer as well, because, you know, why not? While I'm at it, while I'm doing bullshit, I can also, like, bullshit my way out. Oh, this is kind of large, actually. But yeah, so <laughs> this is weird. Um, yes, so you can do that, but you can also do other things. And uh, for that, I quickly update my library, because we only work with the latest version. But this GLTF model does not work with the latest version. Don't get me started. Because we were using GLTF before it was cool, my model is outdated, and I can't be bothered to actually update the, the file. Because it's nice, and I'm like, nah, I don't want to use a different file, or I'll actually get my, the 3D model back. So what we do is, um, ooh, OK. No, that was not what I wanted to do. We can also use an additional library. Uh, this is shameless plug. We are providing this. So. At 3D.io, we give you additional tools for this. So let's go in. And you see there's a new button here called 3D.io. And uh, I can then go in here. And uh, if the internet holds up, which it doesn't seem to be, let's see how the internet does here. I can load a 3D model from our scene library. If the internet doesn't go down, which it probably just did, because it's loading far too long. Great. <sighs> No, wait a minute. It loads the images, so okay. You know what? We're sitting this out. <sighs> no, we're not. Okay. Shouldn't have picked a larger model, I guess. Let's try furniture. It's probably... Ah, here we go. That only took too long. So, yes, here we have an apartment that you probably know if you are watching television. And um, let's see, let me rotate that a little around. And if we go back in, then you might recognize, whoops, you might recognize the apartment, maybe, right? We can actually stand at Sheldon's spot, so <laughs> screw you, Sheldon. Um, so yeah, this is a really, really great way to quickly try things out, to quickly design uh, whatever you want to design, to quickly try what you can do with this. There's much, much more than just this. There's a ton of components available, uh, and there's even more components if you go to the internet and use the components that they provide you with. Oh, now that's going to be fun. Let's see. <sighs> I shouldn't have done that, huh? Oh, it's loading. Yeah, great. Cool. Yeah, awesome. Um, internet, right? You know what, if this is still loading, then what we can totally do is we can totally go out and go back to code, and I'll just show you some more code. I'm flexible. So if I quickly go back to what we did beforehand uh, and get myself the a entity GLTF model, uh, what was it? Model export GLTF, right? Yeah, GLTF. What I can also do is I can include a library that I'm going to include locally now because I'm not that 
A frame extras min JS. I hope that it lives there. Yeah, it says it's it's there, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then we can do things like a ocean. So this one gives us an ocean if I have the right things here. So let's actually go to localhost 8000 again. Loady, loady, loady. Okay, well, the ocean, okay, we have two problems here. Uh, first one is global warming, and the other one is the size of the ocean. Uh, this is a quite small ocean, I would say. So let's get that ocean a little bigger, shall we? Uh, I think it's like with, let's say, 500 meters, and uh, I think it's depth, which is a bit confusing because it's on the Z axis, so it's like depth because it goes into and out of the screen. And um, then we fix the global warming in a second. Well, well, kids, don't use coal energy. It's not coal. Um, I can then go control out i open the inspector again, and help my little flooded house to not be flooded anymore by just reducing the height. Actually, this is kind of cool, isn't it? Like having the ocean in the pool. <laughs> I think I go with this. Um, who doesn't want that? An ocean pool. This is, the, by definition, an infinity pool as well. Um, Moving swiftly back, so I copied the, the uh, coordinates, and here we go. We have an ocean that is no longer flooding our house, and uh, we have the ocean in the pool as well. Which, okay, that looks super weird. <laughs> well, it's not one of my smartest plans. Best laid plans of mice and men. No one reads that, do they? Anyway, uh, here we go. So this looks probably a little nicer. Yeah, that, that's... Yeah, okay, no longer doing weird shit with my pool. Cool, so we have a sweet water pool and we have the ocean around us. My point being here is, these are 16 lines of HTML and uh, we have created quite a bit. Before A-Frame, this would have been hundreds of lines of JavaScript. Even with uh, abstractions such as 3.js, it would still be like 50 lines of JavaScript per a bit of HTML. So I would say, uh, this is a good way of getting going. And a lot of people then ask me, like, okay, great, it's a cool quick start, but is it performant enough to actually do real things with it? The answer to that is yes. Moving swiftly on. No, that's the wrong window. That's the right window. And hey, it has still not finished loading, but okay. So seeing that, we get going with WebVR relatively quickly. And uh, oh, by the way, that was all just like 3D, but it had a little button. If I have a VR headset or if I'm on a phone, it allows me to go into VR and basically just experience it as if I would have just been like with mouse and keyboard. I can just like look around and if my computer or my, my uh, VR system supports it, I can move around as well. And that's nice and fine. But you might ask, Martin, what do I actually do with this? Right? So what can I use this with? And what, what, what project can I realize? Because we all have work and hobbies, and we have to sleep every now and then, I hear. Uh, do get enough sleep, seriously. Like, that's an important thing. A lot of people underestimate how important sleep is. Never go with less than six hours if you can avoid that. Um, so what can I use this for? What projects can I build with this? Is there any use cases? I mean, that was all nice and fun. You know, having like a bit of global warming. Ha <laughs> ha, fun, we all laughed and had a good time. But what are the use cases for business? because I want to actually work with this, but that means that I would have to have a case where I can actually build these projects. So there's a bunch of them, actually, as it turns out. There's healthcare and medical data. So one is actually training medical professionals um, in VR is a great way of actually avoiding to have to deal with dead people to begin with. Um, also, it gives you better visualization qualities because you can, like, stretch it out. And here they are using AR, but it's more or less the same thing, really. Like, the technology foundations are the same, uh, just a different device. So you can, you can use that to train medical professionals. You can actually also use it to train other professionals, like airplane mechanics or something like that. But also you can use it with patients. So here we see a therapeutical um, use case. So for instance, if you suffer fear of heights, or if you suffer arachnophobia, or something like that, so if you are afraid of something, flying, heights, spiders, people, whatever, um, deadlines, <laughs> lack of coffee, um, you can actually use that. Because these, these VR experiences are so immersive, they talk to our lizard brains. So, they basically, so here's an example from me. I was working with an uh, apartment that we built in VR. I was t testing something out, and then I was 
Uh, we use something that's called a teleport control. So basically, you point somewhere on the floor, and then you, you move there, that's, which is great. But this particular apartment was like in the 11th floor, and uh, I accidentally teleported myself outside of the apartment. So I was standing in mid-air in the 11th floor, and I'm like, hmm, 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 hmm. oh my god, OK, all right, all right, all right, OK. Oh, ah, oh there's a chair. Ah, oh, so, oh, uh, I have to have a lie down now. And, um, and my coworkers came and they're like, because I actually, to be honest, I think they are lying, but they say I screamed. Um, so basically, they're like, Martin, are you all right? And I'm, I'm sitting there, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good, yeah. And like, what happened? And like, well, I accidentally teleported myself into midair in the 11th floor. And they're like, yeah, but you're standing in the office. And I'm like, I know. Rationally thinking, I know, but my lizard brain goes, Wah! right? So like, it talks to us on a very direct level. So even though this patient knows she's perfectly safe, See, she's sitting in a room having a good time, um, but uh, that doesn't matter. If there's a spider walking towards her in VR, she's going to be very, very upset if spiders are not her thing. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a use case. But OK, fair enough. How many of us work in healthcare? Who here works in healthcare or medical imaging or something like that? That's what I thought. Um, so Martin, what the hell? And I'm like, well, you know, OK, fair enough. That's like an edge use case. But who here has to deal with marketing departments every now and then? No? Oh, yeah, there's some, yeah, yeah. No, they are lovely people. Don't get me wrong. Like, the best people I've met are um, at least associated to marketing. No, so, like, I have a onesie consultant. Ask me about that later. It's kind of hilarious. And uh, she's in marketing, and she's just brilliant. She's amazing. Because building something doesn't mean that you're used, right? To find users, to get the recognition that you want, to get the feedback from the community that you want, you need marketing. And for marketing, VR is quite an interesting use case. Because especially here, these devices, these cardboard devices, they cost like five euros maximum. If you import 100 of them in, in China, you probably get like two euros per unit. So you can give these away because they work with phones. And most of the people have smartphones, so you can actually do like a giveaway thing. But you can also use them as a stationary device, and you can also use higher-end devices to, to portray something. Because psychology tells us that if we are able to feel a product, and in VR you can't really feel them, but you actually get a really good glimpse. If you sit in a car that you don't own, you are very likely to probably want to own this car in the future, even though it's a virtual reality thing. So marketing is a use case here. Another use case is education. Maybe even, like again, an edge case, but you can take classes to places they can't go. You can take classes to stories that immerse them. So, um, a study shows that preschool and elementary school kids actually have trouble figuring out what happened in real reality and in virtual reality. So if you take a preschool uh, class to Rome, they are pretty convinced they have actually been to Rome, um, which is kind of interesting. But the point is you can do much, much more immersive, much, much more direct storytelling in these cases. And if that happens, we learn differently, and we probably learn better as well. Studies running, so that's pretty interesting. But again, that's kind of like a, an edge case thing, right? But you can use it for tourism. You can take people to places where they might want to go, and then if they are like, oh, yeah, this is a nice beach. I kind of enjoy this. I hear the, you know, the seagulls, and I hear the waves, and oh, all I need now is a drink, so I'm going to book that shit, right? So m tourism is an interesting use case as well, which kind of ties into marketing again. Um, arts. You can create things you can't create in physical reality. This is Tilt Brush. It's a free app from Google. And I suck at drawing. I absolutely suck. I really, really suck. It's like, I draw a car. And people are like, what contraption is this? Is this like a torture machine? I'm like, no, it's a car. You could argue that cars can be torture machines, depending on how bad the traffic is. Um, but yeah, so here we, we see them build things and, and create things and draw things that you can't that easily create in the real world, right? Especially because uh, she is drawing with fire. Um, you probably can do that at home once. And, um, but here you have no, no physical constraints, right? You can draw and build as much as you want. You can draw with music. OK, you can also do that when you're on acid, but you know the consequences are kind of gnarly. Um, you can draw with water, you can draw with light, you can draw with fire. 
And as I said, that's pretty hard to do in physical reality. Uh, you can also use it for entertainment. This is a project from Zurich, because why not? And uh, this brings me back to my asset comment. So here, basically, you're flying like a bird. And it's kind of hilarious until you crash into a building, because then it's not hilarious at all. As I said, like lizard brain things, right? You're like, oh my god, I died there. Um, but it's kind of cool. Like, the fan adjusts speed. So if you're like going down and accelerating, uh, the fan blows faster. And if you go like back up, then the fan blows less hard. And it's kind of hilarious. But that's maybe not like the most use case, uh, the most widely deployed use case. But you can do like games, you can do videos, you can do movies, you can do pretty much everything um, that you can imagine with VR, and it takes the people there. We are no longer looking at a small window in front of us, be it the television window or the computer window or the phone window. Yeah. Um, you actually get the people in the middle of what happens, and that's pretty cool. You can also use it for architecture and real estate. That's our tool that does like touring things, and you can also use that in VR. Uh, it's kind of interesting because you can try out like furniture and, and move things around really quickly, um, unlike in physical reality. So we have a bunch of use cases, actually. And there's much more to come. I mean, we are just starting to explore this. So if you can come up with something where the user benefits from being there, from feeling like it is actually happening, then that's a use case for VR in my book. However, there's like the harsh reality of doing web VR, and I'd like to walk you through a few things. Um, first things first, the market. So we have a very segmented market. Uh, these numbers are from 2016 because the 2017 numbers are still not available. So we have the Oculus Rift at selling roughly 400,000 devices, roughly 500,000 devices for the HTC Vive. PlayStation does a little better with like 800,000 devices. So we have yeah, maybe a million, two million devices in desktop VR. This one is a special one, but still like I count it in. This is like what you put in your living room with a computer or the PlayStation attached to it, and then you enjoy it from the couch or from within your living room. Um, probably like two million devices. Daydream came out as like 100,000 back in 2017, and that's only from like, I think it became available in September or August. So that's only like the last couple of months, and it's already picking up. But then we have the Gear VR, that's mobile. So all of these are uh, desktop VR, these two are mobile. And we see like this is a much higher bar already, and uh, this one is like 2.8 million devices have been sold. You have to have a Samsung phone, but then you basically put your Samsung phone in and have a good time. Um, it's a little like a cardboard. Oh, by the way, the cardboard is missing here. Hmm, why is that? A uh, simple example or a simple explanation, that's why. So, yeah, there are a few cardboards, and that's a pessimistic uh, estimation, because there are so many different variations of the cardboard. If you go to any Chinese dealer site and go like VR headset, they're all pretty much cardboards. Um, some are made from plastic, some are made from actual cardboard. Uh, but basically, we have at least 82 million devices. That's 10 times as much, or more than 10 times as much, as we have Gear VR headsets. And then forget about this, right? Um, but they still exist. Like We still have these devices, but we definitely have to deal with the reality that cardboard is by far the wi most widely deployed one. And uh, that brings us to like what are the differences between the devices. Well, on one end of the spectrum, we do have the HTC Vive. This is like the high-end thing that you can have. You have trackers that track the room. You can move around in the room. You have two controllers, one for each hand. You can do things like, you know, juggle or something. You can add more controllers to like track more things in VR. That's like the high-end one. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have the cardboard, which is the most widely deployed one. This one has a button. Wow. And there are older cardboards that do, or like cheaper ones that do not have a button. Wow. Um, but there's a bit of a difference here. Um, and there's a lot in the middle, right? So like, it's not these two extremes. This is a spectrum, really. 
So you have like the Windows uh, Mixed Reality headsets, you have the Oculus Rift, which is more or less, it, like, it, these two are really close, this one is like closing up, and then we have like the, the Gear VR and the Daydream as mobile, so basically like we have a split here between desktop and mobile, and there's like a wide range of capabilities. So this one, two controllers, this one, two controllers, this one, I don't know, but I think two controllers. This one has zero, like there's a touchpad here, but you also have a controller now. Uh, this one has one controller that's like a, a pointer thing. This one has a button. Hmm. And the price difference is quite stark. So this one costs like 800 euros plus the computer that powers it, right? That's not including the computer that you need to power this one, which is probably 500 euros upwards as well. Uh, and this one costs like five. That excludes the phone that you have to have to put it in. But like iPhones work, um, older Androids work, maybe Windows phones work, who cares? I don't know. So yeah, um, the capabilities are wildly different. We have. Some of them have the possibility to figure out where in the room you are, so you can actually work with like motion. Um, some of them have multiple controllers, some of them don't. Um, some of them are pretty performant because they are powered by a high-performance computer. Some of them are powered by phones, behave very differently. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are mobile, so you have to uh, address the possibility that someone's sitting in a train or something. Um, you never know. Some of them are more like desktop-y, so you have to uh, figure out that, they, okay, there's like space constraints, but we have quite a bit of performance under our hood. Um, now there's like standalone devices coming out, like the, okay, HoloLens is a standalone device, but that's a different one because it's AR. Um, we have the, uh, uh, the Vive something something, so there's like something coming up soonish. There's the Oculus Go, uh, and they don't need a computer or a phone to be powered, they are just like self-contained. Uh, looking forward to try one of those out. And then there's UX challenges. So once you have figured out how to work with the different devices, there's a few interesting problems. One of them is what I call the bucket full of fun. Because if you have motion sickness, um, which is your brain figures out that you're moving differently than what the visual picture does. So like we are really, really susceptible to slight differences. If I turn my head like this and then the picture goes like whoop, that makes a lot of people sick. And I mean, that was a, like an extreme case, but to be like fully up to our movement, we have to be at around 100 frames per second. 60 frames per second is the minimum. Now, web developers know 60 frames per second is often, or actually always, pretty much always, the maximum we get. So, hmm, right? So you definitely want to have a look at the frame rate. Uh, luckily, WebVR gives you a way to actually like update, pick, like update the thing and run the render loop um, as fast as the device can, so you can go up to 120 uh, frames per second. Servo does that as well, so we are getting, like, we are getting there. We're going to see more interesting things to come. Uh, another thing is you, if you un have unexpected movement. That's the most common mistake I see developers do. Screw performance. That's that's a easy one if you be careful. But one of the biggest problems is I point over there because I want to go there, and then I have like a warp motion. That's the equivalent of having someone stand on an office chair that you can move around and go like wee when they least expect it. I like that because I like roller coasters, but not everyone does. It makes people vomit. Don't do that. Uh, also, if the environment is like changing constantly, and uh, you can actually scare people as well. So if you have like floor breaking away, and then the user falling without actually physically falling, the brain goes, "I'm not falling, but I think I'm like I see I'm falling, so I might be poisoned, so I might have eaten something bad, so I'm going to remove it from the body." Bucket full of fun. There we go. Right. So that's one of the things. The other thing is input. Have a look. So here we have hands. Great, right? Yeah, great, that's fun. So yeah, the, the question of how do you do input properly, and I don't even just mean like figuring out the right input me measurements or like the right devices for input. It's also, people are not familiar with this. We understand how mice and keyboards work because we use them all the time. We understand how touch screens work because you use them all the time. Now you have a controller with a bazillion buttons and they move in space and you're like, what the heck is this? What am I supposed to be doing? Like one of the worst things that you can do is forget that the users do not know how this works. You can't assume because no one explains how a mouse works, right? Here is our web shop. There are buttons. They look like this. Use the left thing on the mouse and click on it when the mouse cursor is over. You get the mouse cursor over, but no one does that because we all know how this works, right? 
Even my granddad knows how this works. But with VR, who here has actually used a Vive controller? That's what I thought. So if I say pull the trigger, do you know what I mean? If I say use the grip button, do you know what I mean? No. Right? So make sure that you explain to the users what the heck you want them to do. And if possible, make it super easy for them to use this. One pattern is what's called gaze control. You show a little cursor and you say, like, you move around by using the cursor. By basically, you look around, look at the spot on the floor, and then you move there. And if you look on a thing, it goes, do you really want to do this? And then it triggers the action. It's like clicking. And people are like, ah, like clicking. So basically, I just like, it's like I would be aiming with a mouse. Much easier to understand for users. Um, also, controllers vary. So if you have like a complicated action, like, oh, I require you to press these two buttons at the same time. What if these, these things are wireless, right? What if the battery is dead? That means I can't use your application. Press two buttons, like both controller triggers at the same time. I'm like, I only have one because the other one is charging. Screw you. And you're like, it's not doing anything. Don't assume that people have controllers. There are uh, A-frame progressive controls. They allow you to basically figure out what the controllers are and then use them as you like them. Um, also, we don't actually know how things work, right? There's very, very few established patterns. As I said, like button clicks, we know how this works. But a button in VR, what do I do? Do I have to actually like push it with my hand? But if I don't have a controller, how do I push that button? Oh, I, I look at, okay, right, I look at it, I understand now. But you know, it's like, it's not that easy. We don't have established patterns that we can rely on. Also, moving things around or moving people around. This is like pretty cool. Because it's like one of these mag magician ninja things. You throw a ball over there, and then you get a second one, and then you go, boof. Um, quite cool. But I have no idea how to use that if I'm not being explained that this is how it works. Because you're like, I have two controllers. I want to go there. How do I do this? With this HTC Vive, you can walk in the room, but then there's a wall. You're like, but I want to go there. <laughs> right? So you, we have to work this out. One of the patterns that is being established there is that you point and press a button and then you teleport there, which is easier than this one. Um, but it's, it, this one looks kind of super cool. When you see it, you're like, oh yeah, that is awesome. But when you are the user that has to figure out how this works, it's not that awesome anymore. And also, figure out, like, you know, you have to throw a ball. So how precisely can you throw that ball to where you want to go? It's not that easy. Also. WebVR is not doing 3D rendering. You still have to deal with WebGL for the actual 3D rendering. What WebVR gives you is an API to access the controllers, to access the position and orientation, so where the user looks and where the user stands or sits, um, and the, the higher frame rate that the device uh, uh, supports. And also, it gives you access to the devices itself. So that's kind of cool. Browser support. <laughs> we have Chrome on Android. Yay. We have Firefox since a couple of months. Edge is supporting them. Yes, yes Edge. And uh, Samsung Internet is supporting it. There's an experimental Chrome build. Hopefully next year, in the first quarter of next year, we'll see desktop Chrome support WebVR as well. And then Servo, which is this experimental browser from Mozilla, um, that's also supporting WebVR already. So that's kind of cool. Uh, there's polyfills available for other browsers on mobile phones. So iPhones kind of do support cardboard VR, at least. Also, there's stupid people doing stupid things. Uh, he's in VR in a car. Don't do that. It's a bad idea for very obvious reasons. Um, anyway, so let's, let's recap the lessons we learned. First things first, make it responsive, because you don't know what devices are there. And even though there's 82 million uh, cardboards out there, that's like Germany. And all the rest of the world would then be empty or a void of uh, a card or a VR headsets. So make it responsive. And the web allows you to do that. We've seen it on my computer. That was like we could walk around and try things out. That's pretty cool. Um, avoid the UX cliffs. We don't have established patterns. Controllers vary wildly. Um, users don't know how to use them. Okay, Ex explain to your users in a nice way. Guide them in, like Mario did. Mario was relatively easy to learn. It's like, okay, I press that button and then I walk left. Oh, I fell off. Oh, there's the A button. OK, now I jump. And oh, OK, huh, here we go. So you were guided into uh, how this game works. Um, and there's so much to explore. And with A-Frame, it is not that hard to get going. So I highly, highly, highly recommend you try it out. 
Even if you don't have a use case or project right now, try it out. Try to see what you can build. Even if it's like super simple, super small, it is a getting started going point. And if you find something that is hard to do, talk to me and other people who are in WebVR. Talk to Samsung, talk to Mozilla. Uh, we love to hear your feedback. And um, there's a few more things that you can look into. The first one is like an interactive tutorial. The second one is videos I do. Uh, the A-Frame blog, our blog, and to DIO for more things to do with A-Frame. So build something with it. Show it to me. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I love to see what people are building with this. And with that, I'm done. Spasiba, Vasayev.